Welcome to the video. I've had a number of new subscribers who are coming to Remote Control to fly multicopters ask about the process to learn how to fly. Some people are struggling with some of the parts or as they progress in the hobby are getting caught out and having crashes or flyaways or potentially accidents. So what I wanted to do was cover the way that I teach the pupils that I deal with um, and uh, talk you through my 10 step program. Now there's no guarantees with this, this is just based on my experience and something that existed when I started to learn how to fly remote control helicopters about 10 years ago which was called RADS School of Rotary Flight and that's RADS with two Ds. It was a fantastic step-by-step -step process, you can google it and still find it around today and it was a nice way to learn and it kind of gave you an easy way to get a remote control copter in the sky safely. And a lot of it was actually learning how to do things, um, skidding it around on the tiles in the kitchen on the floor. Um, and at the time, I didn't really appreciate what it was teaching me. I just followed the process because that's what everyone in the forum said was the best way to do it. Looking back, it was actually a fantastic way to do it because too often in the hobby, I see people buying a model, trying to do too much too quickly and uh, smashing the model to pieces or having an accident and putting other people and property at risk. And it's our duty as pilots to be responsible and make sure that we are being as safe as we possibly can and are respecting everything and everybody around us when we're flying. It won't take too many more crashes before there starts to be more legislation and the hobby that we love is impacted unless we all make sure we are doing the right thing. So my 10-step program uh, will run through in this presentation. Um, a couple of things to keep in mind before we get into the 10 steps. Pilots that have been flying for a while make it look really easy. And I know that's something that frustrates um, people when I start to teach them is that I'll kind of give a demo and show them flying around and have give them an experience with um, wearing the goggles as I fly so they can FPV and then they get the controls and it is fantastically complicated and very alien. Even people that have been gamers all their lives and are very used to holding a, some kind of control and having the fine motor skills to move the sticks around take time to learn how the model reacts because it is a physical thing and physics is in action and they are much more naturally stable than remote control helicopters but you're always having to correct for uh, drift. So don't be fooled by uh, somebody that's been doing it for two or three years, it isn't always as easy as it looks. The modern systems are a lot easier to fly with the self level and GPS modes and all the other bits and bobs. They make flying so much more accessible than it used to be. When multirotors first started, all of those aids weren't available and those of us that came to them from remote control helicopters were amazed at how stable and easy to fly they were compared to an RC helicopter. My analogy is that an RC helicopter is like trying to balance an egg on top of a balloon and the um, RC multicopters are much more stable. It's like they're dangling off a piece of string. So that kind of idea of uh, stability is that much different. And now with the new control boards, it's even easier. It can lull you into a false sense of security that you think you're flying really well, but occasionally things like the GPS aid, self level and other things will go wrong. And that's when you have a problem. It's easy to fall into thinking you can fly because you can hover and fly away and a number of uh, students have been caught out to this and then eventually came back um, and said, yeah, you're right. The challenge is, is that because they're easy to fly and they're easy to hover and move around is that they can hover it and they can fly it away by keeping the tail in and then they can pull it all the way back and then get it to hover and land at their feet again and then they think they can fly and they're ready to put FPV equipment and other pieces on it. That is not flying. That is advanced hovering. And we'll talk about that as we go through the 10 step process. You need to be able to fly it around in all orientations. You need to be able to hover it in all orientations so that if you have a problem with the craft, then you can recover it and you have the best possible chance of bringing the craft in and landing it safely without an accident. This takes time. There are no shortcuts to this. It, it took me the best part of two years 
Um, wasn't a particularly quick learner, but it took me about two years to get the hang of everything. And then it probably took me about another 18 months to be completely comfortable with nose in. Um, we'll talk about what that means in a minute. But three and a half years to be able to get a hold of something is a long time, but it is a fantastic achievement when you get hold of a new skill in the hobby. Don't be disheartened if you can't do it straight away. Some people pick it up faster than others. Some people it's very natural. Some things uh, like nose in for me took me forever to do it and involved me sitting indoor or area for most of one December with a small model, just plugging away at it until eventually it clicks in my head. Using a simulator to practice is great and I would always recommend getting a simulator to try. Phoenix RC or Real Flight is, um, are both fantastic systems. Uh, they're very good for practicing and developing the muscle memory for the thumbs so you don't get what some pilots call dumb thumb which is occasionally where you just lose orientation and it all goes to pot. Um, the more practice you have, the less that can happen but even as experienced pilots get caught out. Um, but I would always say use a smaller craft to practice with. Lots of subscribers come on the channel and trying to build big, powerful, complicated quadcopters and hexcopters. And when they're building their first one, I always recommend get yourself a little quadcopter, something like a Hubsan X4, and then spend every waking hour that you're not building your next model with that smaller model practicing all of these steps. By the time you get the bigger model in the air, you will be a much safer pilot and you'll actually have less crashes with the bigger model. You will crash a lot. Crashing is part of how you learn as part of the hobby, so make sure that when you buy things like props and you buy motors in your building, you have a spare motor, you get a number of spare props, you might buy an extra spare arm or two for the model because you will smash the living heck out of it. That is just the way it is. Occasionally you will have dumb thumb, you'll have that mental stutter, and before you know it, you'll be correcting it the wrong way, and you will be getting into big trouble, and it'll be smashing into trees, walls, ground, everything you uh, don't want it to hit. That's why it's important that you make sure that you have as much practice as possible to give you the best chance of recovery. You also need to make sure that the model's set up well. Uh, my very first RC helicopter was bought from a local hobby shop that actually test flew the model before it sent, they sent it to you. Um, that was an amazing service because I knew that that RC helicopter was set up and trimmed perfectly so I could try to fly it. Now it only took me about 10 minutes to crash it, but at least I knew that the crash was down to me, not down to something that wasn't set up on the model. So take your time, go through, make sure everything is set up properly. If you have a friend in the hobby or someone you can talk to, then take them through it, let them have a go at the model and trim it perfectly for you so that when you're trying to learn all these pieces and go through the steps, then you're not fighting the craft as well as trying to learn. Each of these steps do take time. Some of them feel really boring and really labored. But like I talked about at the top of the video, what you need to do is make sure that you can master each of these steps and when you've mastered them all, you'll be a far more accomplished, safe pilot. And the last bit, there's no guarantees. This is my method. It tends to work for me. It tends to work with the people that um, I'm teaching to fly. Um, other people have different ways of doing it and it might not work for everybody. Having said all that, Let's get into the 10 steps. So we're going to assume that you've bought yourself something like a little Hubsan X4 and that you have a nice open area indoors like the floor of a hall or a kitchen that um, ideally isn't carpeted, is covered in something like lino or tiles so that the model can scoot around a little bit without getting uh, caught up or damaging anything. Step one is very straightforward. What you do, this is the basic hover. And what we're going to do here, we're not going to use anything apart from the throttle and the elevator and aileron. Elevator and aileron will move it backwards and forwards, left and right. And we're going to increase the throttle so the model just lifts off the ground by about half an inch to an inch or so. And then we're going to fight it because it will feel like we're fighting it and trying to keep it in a three foot one meter square for as long as we possibly can. 
The model will try and wander around. It's also sat in its own downdraft, so that will create little eddies in the, um, the air around the craft, which will make it move. And this is all about learning how the model reacts, the kind of inertia, the kind of control input that you have to put to correct it from going off in one direction or the other. This will take quite a few batteries for you to master and you'll know when you've mastered it because you'll be able to keep it within an inch to two inches of where you take off and it will become almost second nature so you don't have to consciously think about it. It will be an unconscious correction that you're doing all the time. We're not turning the model round, we're not doing so that its um, backside is facing away from you. All we're doing is keeping its bum facing towards you, you're stood behind it and you're keeping an inch off the ground and trying to keep it as still as humanly possible. Once you've cracked that and that's dead easy, then the next thing is the tail in hover. And now we're going to try and fly it a little bit higher. So we're going to fly it um, again Around knee height is perfect. You don't really want it flying any more than that. But now you're going to be out of its own ground effect. The air is going to be a little bit cleaner. But this is about practicing again, keeping it in one position in the sky. This also now will start to have to use the throttle a little bit more because as we put in corrections to move the model left and right, we'll also lose a little bit of thrust and it'll sink slightly. So you have to put more throttle in little bit like patting your head and rubbing your stomach at the same time but again once you practice this quite a bit it will start to become second nature and easier and easier once that is starting to become second nature and it will take quite a few batteries for that to work as well lesson three is movement when in a hover so so far all of the lessons has been around trying to keep it still this one is about trying to put the model where we want it to be now we've got that three foot one meter imaginary square in this we're going to take it off have it about knee height again is perfect and then we're going to fly it around into each of the corners in turn of the square we're not going to rotate the craft we're not touching the rudder all we're doing is we are gently slowly slowly is the key moving it around that square from corner to corner until the battery gives up and again we want to do that until it becomes easy and it's second nature because now not only are we correcting our uh, for the hover and making sure that we're correcting for any over uh, movement of the controls but now we're actually starting to move around too once we've got that down pat moving the tail and hovering this is the step that for me was really really hard getting to step three was a piece of cake step four gave me heartache so what we're going to do is this time we're going to take off and rather than keep the tail of the craft pointing directly towards us, we're going to use the rudder and give it 5, 10, 15 degrees in either direction so that it's not pointing directly towards us. This means now that the aileron and the elevator stick don't correspond to the craft. And this is where we're starting to learn that we have to correct for the orientation of the vehicle when we're putting in the correction. Now when you start off, you might just want to put the tail very slightly to one side or the other and then practice again, trying to maintain the hover and move around that three foot one meter square. Once you have uh, that working and you think you've got it down pat, increase the angle that the tail is away from you and until you can get it working. Make sure that you're trying one way anti-clockwise and then clockwise don't keep going one way because what you'll find is you'll develop a tendency uh, to be happier one way than the other but you're going to keep doing that until you can get the tail so it's almost 90 degrees to one side this takes quite a bit of time and is fantastically frustrating and requires a lot of mental processing to do this. You almost have to pretend that you're a little pilot sat in the um, model itself so you're always looking out the front and that can help you get the hang of this step. Step five, now we're going to start, now we can control the craft and we can hover it using the, um, the in different orientations. Uh, we can now start to do a little bit of flying or, well, I would call it advanced hovering. 
So what we're going to do is go into a bigger space, ideally a back garden with something like lots of grass that you can land on is perfect. And we're going to think about having a big oblong or big square on that open area. And again, we're going to take off, keep it about um, the height of your waist or your knee height, and we're going to go around each of the corners in turn. Again, slowly, very controlled. What you're going to do is fly down one side of the box. When you get to the corner, stop the craft, hover it, rotate it 90 degrees, then push the elevator forward, and then continue to fly down the next leg. And fly clockwise, and then fly anti-clockwise. Because again, if you keep flying one way around, you'll develop a tendency and that will be the one that clicks in your head and then you'll find that going the other way around will be really tricky. So keep alternating it. And this is relatively uh, easy to do. This is where it really starts to get fun. One, because it feels like you're flying and two, you can actually make a bit of movement. It's very tempting when you do this to really start hooting it around. Um, we're not there yet. At the moment, it is all slow, small, steady, controlled, slow movements that you are managing. Once the boxes is fixed and lesson five is done, then we go on to lesson six, which is now slow figure eight, which is what kind of what we were doing before with a left and a right handed box. But now we're going to swap over in the middle. And now we're getting to the point where you're naturally starting to fly in all attitudes. And you can also, if you wanted in lesson six, also try and do some um, banking turns where not only are, are you stopping in the corners, rotating, then carrying on, but maybe a couple of corners you can try gently um, using the aileron and the rudder to do a smooth corner as well. Once you've got the hang of figure eight, then we're on to lesson seven. This is where we have to kind of go back to the drawing board a little bit. The reason that I don't do lesson seven earlier on is because lesson seven is a killer and uh, it's nice to have lesson six and five that you can go back to if uh, lesson seven is uh, kicking your butt. This is the nose in hover. This is the thing that took me forever to do. So this time we're back in our three foot one meter square and we're going to take the craft off tail in. We're going to flip it around 180 degrees so the nose of the craft is pointing directly towards us and we're going to do very similar to what we did in lessons two and three in that we're going to practice hovering it and then moving it around that square. Now this is really tricky because every single one of the controls is actually reversed so if you push the elevator forward the craft goes back. And the way that I learned that was the tip that helped me get the hang of this is that whichever way the craft is drifting in lesson seven, that's the way that you want to push the stick towards to correct that drift. So if it's drifting to the right, you push the um, stick to the right and that's the correction that you actually need. This will take some time and it will hurt your head. Uh, some people get this really quickly, I didn't. So lesson eight is the random direction hover. This is quite a fun one, particularly with the small craft uh, when it's a nice still day, or I uh, spent with my nose in hover with uh, lesson seven and lesson eight for me were uh, completely sorted one dark December where I had my Hubsan X4 and my wife would very patiently watch the TV with a little Hubsan hovering in the middle of the room. Now, the way this works is you take the little Excopter off, you uh, then hit the rudder, you flip it round and round and round, and then you randomly stop it. And then the aim of the game is to then maintain the hover and fly and move it around without moving the tail again. So it's a great way and great practice to test all those skills that you've been learning in the previous lessons so that you can hover and recover no matter the orientation of the craft. Lesson nine, now we are ready to do some serious flying. Now we know how to hover, we know how to turn, we know how to um, coordinate our turns, we know how to stop the craft. So now we can actually get into a nice big space and keeping visual range, we can start to fly the craft further and further away. This is the point typically where I would say, you know what, you're almost ready for your bigger craft, you just need to keep practicing the flying so that you, uh, you, you always know which way it's pointing. 
you know which way you have to correct. And if somebody just said, right, and snap their fingers and you had to pull the craft up into a hover and control it before flying on, you could do at any point in the pattern. Now we know how to do this, all of the lessons are cemented together. Then the final step is lesson 10. And this is the point where you'll find that the smaller model means that you can only fly probably 20, 30 feet away from you before you lose orientation completely because you physically can't see which way the model's pointing. This is the time where you get your bigger model out and you can start flying the bigger one. It'll have more inertia, it'll have more power, it'll make more noise, it'll be a lot more dangerous. But with the 10 lessons that you have now finished, you will find that you can control the craft and you are a much better able pilot. The problem is, is that when you've, uh, you start with a small one, you'll get something like a 330 or a 450 class quad, and then you'll find the quads and the models get bigger and bigger and bigger as you want to fly them further and further away, and then you'll start wanting to put cameras on them, FPV equipment, and other bits and pieces. And the last thing I want to talk about is actually FPV. FPV is something that I love. There's loads of FPV stuff on my channel. This is where you pop a little camera on the craft and you're looking at the view out that camera on some goggles that are connected via a radio to the model itself. Wonderful thing to be able to do. I am always nervous when pilots say, oh, I don't need to know all that. I'm going to fly FPV. The reason that I'm always nervous for that is that unfortunately FPV systems will fail. Um, GPS return to home and self-level systems can fail and when they do then it's up to you and your skill and experience as a pilot to bring that craft back in safely and land it without incident. If you can't do that then you are putting people, pets and property at risk and that is in my opinion a dangerous thing to do and the more examples of where people are hurt by these craft, particularly when the people are flying FPV, the more backlash there will be and will end up, as we talked about at the beginning, with more legislation and more barriers to us being able to enjoy and do our hobby. So if you're looking at flying FPV, great, that's a wonderful thing to do, but I would absolutely recommend that when you're doing FPV, it means that you are going to be flying to the edges of your line of sight and in those instances, you need to be making sure that there are visual cues on the model so you can always uh, check what orientation it's in and you have the 10 lessons securely under your belt so that when you pop the goggles off when you have a problem, you can immediately figure out which way the craft is pointing, take control of it, arrest any momentum, put it into a hover and then bring it back to you safely and land it at your feet. FPV is not an excuse to learn to be a good pilot. It's a, another way to enjoy the hobby. So hopefully that's interesting for those of you that have been asking about this. Um, thank you for watching. Please uh, comment, like and subscribe. And as always, very happy flying.